Hey, Devina is here. Yeah, hi, Rahul. Hi, Devina. Hi, hi, hi. Wonderful. Thanks to have you for these spaces. I just start, I started a couple of minutes early to do the setup. And uh, meanwhile, I, you know, we are already past it. Right. I, yeah. I just realized I needed to give some permissions to the app, which it took me a minute. So. Yeah. Yeah, it takes quite a bit to set up. Uh, you'd ask me to add two of your colleagues. I'm trying to find them so I can add them as speakers. Yeah, I, I can see Alok Kumar. That, that okay, is... I'll add Alok. That would be easy if he's already there. Yeah. I'll just... Alok 04 something. I just thought in case somebody wants some specific data, I might need them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we wait wait another minute or so to start. No, no, we start on time. Thumb rule okay. of life. Okay, we start yeah. on zero audience. Also, we start on time. Okay, okay. So, so so then I'm let's going start. To, I'm going to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very very quick, very very quick uh, uh, introductions. So uh, Devina is co-founder of First Global. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, First Global is thirty years, right? Devina, now about thirty years. Yes, thirty years. Okay. 30 years. So a massive track record, huge success, and a voice of reason and sanity in especially times like these. Uh, so I, you know, I've done an investor hour with Devina earlier, and I've been in touch with her. And when all these things were happening about small cap, mid cap, large cap, and also the whole LRS thing about investing uh, internationally, which is now going into effect on 1st of October with a higher TDS rate, I just thought we should get her in and, you know, talk this stuff. Uh, hopefully, you know, there'll be enough in there to help all the attendees take more meaningful investment decisions. Of course, there's no advice being given. It's just information and input and opinion. And you can, you know, make the most of it. Uh, uh, so that's one. Second, uh, I'm co-hosting this with Prince. Prince has this amazing community on uh, X. Uh, and they host uh, spaces almost every day, if I'm not mistaken. And he's got a very loyal following. So we do this. Uh, we always have him over so he can back me up in case I fumble with the technology. And uh, even as we speak, I think I just saw Safir over here. So that's wonderful. Safir, welcome to the spaces. You're the surprise guest for today, I believe. Uh, Thank you and good evening to everybody. And, good evening. And, and Safir, on behalf of everyone, many congrats. I did see a post from you saying you guys were ranked amongst the top law firms in India recently. So many congrats on that. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, and if I may just add uh, that it makes perfect sense for a top-notch lawyer to be on a podcast discussing stocks. It's so logical. <laughs> but, uh, you know, your, 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 uh, your discussions on stocks, of course, have... Uh, entice people to that. So we'll we'll see how that goes today. Chalo, wonderful. Uh, I'm going to kick it off with uh, Devina, of course. Devina, a broad question for you. Lay the ground for us in terms of what's happening in the economy and stock markets. Just give us the lay of the land first to begin with. Uh, hi, Rahul. Uh, good evening to all the listeners also. Uh, thanks for uh, taking the time on a Friday evening on a long weekend. Uh, to do this. Uh, so uh, in terms of the, let us let me first uh, start with the market, Rahul, because uh, the economy is uh, a whole different game altogether. So in terms of the market, uh, uh, I don't know whether you, uh, you had seen that, but end of March, I had tweeted that this is the time to be in the markets. And uh, the, all of us understand the risk of not uh, uh, risk of being invested in the market that the markets might go down, but there is also a risk to not being in the market because if you're not invested and the market goes up, then you have lost out on the up move, which you can never make up when the move is fast. So uh, we had done this exercise uh, last year and, you know, the numbers have changed a bit, but the, uh, but the percentages have not. So if you had invested, in 1980, 100 rupees. So that would have become last year, 44,000, this year, 56,000, something like that. But the trick is this, that in this 40 odd year, if you had missed out just the 10 best days, just the 10 best days, you would think 40 years, 10 days is nothing. 
uh, you would have lost out on two thirds of the return. So that forty four thousand goes down to fifteen thousand. If you miss out on the thirty best days, which is just about one day uh, less than one day a year. I mean, thirty days in forty years, you lose out on ninety percent of the returns. So as I had said in March, this is I think March twenty eighth or something. My tweet is there that uh, this is one of those times where if you are not invested, you will regret it. And with no ifs and buts, I had said if you ask me today, is the market at its bottom? I don't know, but it is somewhere in the range, and definitely the probability of it going up is higher. So since then, if you see uh, the Nifty at that time was less than seventeen thousand. I think it was sixteen thousand nine hundred something. So it's obviously gone up seventeen, eighteen percent since then. Um, but uh, even now, uh, my view is that we are closer to the beginning of the move than the end of the move, as far as the Nifty or Sensex or the large caps are concerned. And again, you step back. All of us have this uh, figure in mind that uh, if you invest in the Indian equity markets. you will get a return of 15 16% compounded because that's been the return since uh, the at least the indices have been around but you know the variation is very high and the variation people think okay you know one year you will make high return next year you will make no low return but it is not even on that basis even if you look at in a whole decade basis so let's say you invested in 1980 in the next 10 years your 100 rupees would have become 700 rupees but if you invested in 2010 your 100 rupees at after 10 years would have become only 230 rupees and you know that's only a compounding of 8.8% i think uh, in a decade when fixed deposits used to give you 7 and a half or thereabouts so you know that there can be a whole decade when you really don't get compensated but the point is this that once you have a decade like that and then you start to come out of it you start to outperform again <laughs> then that again that run is likely to be longer so even if you look at this decade from the beginning because of a lot of global factors and the pandemic and the war and this and that we have still not compounded at any great number you know we are still around 12 and a half percent compounding so point is that we are still very much below the trend line so the risk of a crash comes when you are above the trend line if you are this much up below the trend line there is you know typically no risk of a huge crash so even now as i said for the large caps my view would be that you should be invested to whatever extent you want to be invested in equities i never say even for young people that put 100% of your money in equities So, I mean, like yesterday, my nephew and niece were asking me. I said, you know, you might want to buy a house uh, some time later. So, you know, I would not say that put everything in equities. Always have a balance. So, the so this is this is as far as the large caps are concerned. But there's a somewhat of a different story uh, uh, on the small cap, mid cap side. There has been a lot of you know frenzy around it. even if you look at uh, mutual fund flows there has actually been uh, i think a net outflow from large cap mutual funds and a huge inflow into small cap funds now the thing in small caps again you step up step back look at the data and you see that there have been huge crashes which people forget about it is a risky end of the market never forget that so in 2008 from that peak the small cap index had fallen almost 80% 78% to be exact uh, over just about 14 15 months and then it took another 6 plus years to come back to that 2008 peak so i mean i see all this picking and choosing of data people saying that small cap index can go up five times look at this period i mean <laughs> what people don't realize is that percentages are not symmetrical if you if something falls 80% if it goes from 100 to 20 even if it goes up five fold you are only back to base zero yeah, this is a very basic thing but i see the so called influencers and other people giving these kind of data points that this is what you can expect in small cap chezal mein five times ho gaya 
<laughs> without giving the picture that it had fallen 80% just before that and that was not the only time you know again you had this frenzied bull market in small caps in 2017 and 2018 onwards again in about less than a year and a half the index fell 65% from the top so again almost a two third fall so again it has to triple to come back to that number you know this is what people don't realize that when something falls two third it has to triple to come back to that number so but really the thing with small caps also is this that when i say that the index came back to that level in 7 years actually the small cap index churns 18 20% every year so in 5 years time or 6 years time it almost nothing of the original index is left so the stocks that made that high again in 2000 um uh, 16 were not the stocks that crashed in 2008 or 2000 wale eight wale stocks you know they went out they became penny stocks they went to zero and so on so that's the part people forget so it's a risky end of the market so you have to play it very carefully another argument i hear often is ki you know index ka jo bhi hota hai i am picking my stocks very carefully and i'll do well so how likely is that so in that 2008 9 crash i was looking at how many small cap stocks went up it was a grand total of 1% in the 2018 to 20 crash it was 8% so it is foolish to say the least that you are this great genius who will have investments only in this these stocks one other thing price is one thing with small caps what often happens is that on the way up there is liquidity when they start to crash there is no liquidity so you can't even exit the price also becomes theoretical so i mean i'm not saying never invest in small caps but limit your exposure to so both in our pms and our small case for example we rarely if ever go about 20% exposure in small caps so uh, as i have you know said very often in, on many platforms that investing is a loser's game you win only if you don't lose so your first and most important part of your investment or portfolio management is to make sure that you don't have a big loss on your capital you don't have a big drawdown on your capital so this would be my sort of base for the markets at least rahul yeah so let, let's hold that thought on the economy we'll stick to the market for now we'll come back to the economy so uh, uh you know you made uh, so many interesting but so many thought provoking points just for the listeners you know uh devina recently wrote a piece for money control where a lot of this data has been shared i'll try and put up that note uh, uh, on my uh, i'll make a post on twitter or x after this and you can you know get that uh, those data points so uh So I think what Devina, you are really saying is that so other than the points of you want to avoid losses, you want to remain invested for long periods of time. Uh, timing is very difficult. Don't uh, data pick. You are basically saying at this point in time, it's a story of two markets. There is a larger cap market, let's say a higher quality market, where you are saying you are closer to the beginning than to the end in terms of the opportunity, and then you are saying that there is a smaller cap. uh pit cap market where it's largely lower quality there are good quality but largely lower quality and that's where the uh, the excitement may have gone a little bit overboard and uh, how people read these two will really how they read and how they decide to act on it will you know probably decide how their portfolios uh, do going forward uh safir you are a very you know active active investor not in terms of a trader but active in the sense you're tracking all this you're reading all reports in between your legal briefs and all that what's your understanding what give us your opening comments on this large cap versus small cap and your lay of the land for the stock markets yeah so when it comes to investing i you know have completely tried my level best in the last several years of my investing career to remove the bias when it comes to large cap mid cap and small cap for for example it does not matter to me if i'm buying a large cap vis-a-vis a small cap uh, i have to look for an opportunity in the market and uh, my ability is to try and understand if there is an opportunity in the market 
if that opportunity is understood by me both first as a company then as a promoter then in terms of the magnitude of what that particular sector can lead to uh, then i go on the assumption that if a company is to lead in a sector maybe it will do better relative to the sector and if it doesn't usually i will not have a single participant participation in the sector at least pick two companies so the point is that i don't have this sort of uh, bias when it comes to large cap versus small caps even in this market i do predominantly agree with the view that there is a euphoria in the small caps because companies that are not being understood and are very difficult to understand uh, you know you cannot take a company and say i'm going to multiply it by 100 times 200 times 300 times without even a proven track record uh in terms of even some of the ipos certain companies have records of performance only in the last one or two years which could be attributed to ma- many reasons including accounting uh, you know restructuring of accounting and things of that sort related party transactions and many other things it is not uh, you cannot be gung ho uh, essentially in terms of what you don't understand i mean it's sometimes the stability and you know what devina is saying in terms of liquidity is absolutely right because if the market goes through a shake out and you do not understand the company then you would have you, by the time you decide to react the stocks would have retracted a lot but on the other hand if you understand a company and you know usually you are accustomed to market compounding at 13 14% per annum you will have the withdrawal the ability to withdraw those particular stocks and maybe even average and if you have disposable money etc and therefore over a, you will be back on track even if you are de- derailed Uh, having said that like on any day like i'll give an example of today and i'm not going to talk about a trade but an example my job is to find what you know where i can deploy my money uh, to the best uh, optimal returns as long as i can beat fixed deposit adjusted for risk uh, i'm fine and if i find the opportunity in a large cap it will be a large cap and if it's in a small cap it will be in a small cap so i buy both but i will never overdo anything any i will never overdo a sector i will never overdo a market cap and i'll never overdo a sort of buying four players in a sector just because the sector is booming yeah yeah and i think uh, that's a wonderful point you make and uh, i just want to add uh, to what both devin and safir are saying effectively is that uh, if you are uh, discretionary in your investments uh, you have the choice of whether to invest in a small cap or not and you have to be careful you have to follow the process and buy the right small cap you don't get it you don't get it your money will end up in a large cap uh, the other day you know i i went through a presentation by a very successful mutual fund in india which does not have a small cap fund and they were showing data on what's happening in the small cap space and they showed of course the the point even devina mentioned that large cap funds are actually losing money uh uh and there's money rushing into small cap funds now notice one thing the small cap fund has no choice but to buy small cap stocks exactly the opposite of what you know safir is saying about devina is applying so they have to keep buying stock now if tens of thousands of crores are going into small caps and small caps have only limited amount of liquidity available what do you think is going to happen Now here's a very interesting data point they shared Devi and Safir they showed that the average number of stocks held by a small cap mutual fund has actually increased quite dramatically in the last one year so to deploy the money they were getting in they are buying more and more stocks which means moving further and further away from pristine quality to get those stocks and then you know if something goes wrong and they have to liquidate and you can imagine what's going to happen they stuck with poor quality stocks and poor liquidity and they're going to get you know they they could be in water hot water so uh yeah so uh, the situation is uh, what it is uh so uh, devina uh, coming back to you on this uh, small cap large cap uh how does the economy feed into this right now uh t- talk to us a little bit about that and then uh if you could spend a little more time i don't know whether you going to talk sector or not i i i would love it if you can talk a little bit about your approach which sort of tries to limit all these biases etc and the way you guys look at data so that maybe that will be helpful for the listeners uh, you know as they decide what to do with their money 
Yeah, Rahul, you have woven in quite a few questions in one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know what Safir was saying was exactly right, that you must uh, diversify your bets. I mean, essentially what he was saying was that don't skew towards only one sector or only one type of stocks or so on. So that that's very important to diversify your bets and the data point you shared Rahul was also very interesting that that means essentially that to deploy the money the small cap mutual funds are in all probability lowering the quality or whatever their criteria initially was so which which means that if if I mean I mean right now our systems are not showing that you know small caps are going to crash tomorrow or anything like that but I'm saying this means that if at all at any point uh, that there is a slide, it will tend to accelerate because all these people will be holding stocks that may not be liquid anymore. As far as the economy is concerned, uh, still some concerns areas, uh, Rahul. One thing, of course, which has been around for some time, which we all know about, which I've spoken about earlier also, that the recovery was more a K-shaped recovery. So it was like if you look at luxury cars selling very well, luxury homes selling very well, and a whole different picture emerges when you look at two-wheelers and entry-level cars or you look at affordable housing, none of which showed an acceleration. And just before this, I was reading this article in Mint on the rural uh, um, you know areas and how this you know we are only looking at food inflation and what lies behind the food inflation is a lot of crop failure and things like that if you look at the macro numbers uh, you know india's savings rate came to i don't know i think 45 or 47 year low something like that so those are worrisome things because those you know that those are the drivers ultimately in the long term of the economy so if there are concerns there, then you don't have uh, economy that's firing on all engines. The market can to an extent is isolated because listed uh, stocks uh, don't form the bulk of the economy and also they tend to cater to the more affluent consumers. So you can have a situation where there are concerns on the economy, but the market or even corporate earnings continue to do well. So those, those, I mean, there can be some disconnect between the two. And one other, I mean, on a longer term, my big concern about the economy is that we are missing out on a large part of our demographic dividend. See, because demographic dividend, we think of as having a lot of young people, which we do have. But actually, there are three factors First is how many young or working age people do you have in the population? The second factor is that how many of them are actually working? And the third factor is the productivity of those who are working. So we are failing on the second count itself. Our uh, job creation is very poor and it is even worse for the young people. So that is my big concern because this is the time when you can take the economy and the per capita income to a different plane, because this is available only for a limited period of time. You know, after some time, that proportion of working age population will start to decline. And that time, like, you know, it's running out. So, you know, those, those, that's the, if you, if you talk of the economy side, yeah. those would be my concerns. Yeah, and, 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 yeah. Sorry, sorry, please go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you. I missed out on something or the other which you asked because you asked so many things. I, so, yeah. I had a pro. I'm a, I'm a pro at asking questions. I mix up all my questions. Sorry about that. But uh, <laughs> on the on, but on the economy, on the economy, what you say about unemployment and all, I think uh, one aspect is it's very difficult to predict macro when you are investing. So you know that's something uh, you know I think Buffett Munger said all the time. It's very difficult. You focus on the companies, you find the right companies, and they'll deal with the situations, and you know you'll be fine. I just want to add one line on the unemployment because uh, when, uh, not 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 what you said, but typically when I hear people talk of unemployment, they think it is India specific, and I think they miss the larger picture that youth unemployment is not India centric. I think even if you look at data in China, which has had amazing growth over the last few decades, even there, 
urban youth employment is i think in the high teens i may i need to fact check this but it's very high i was shocked when i saw that number so i think yeah, there is yeah but now uh, they are at five times our per capita they can afford yeah, to take a breather yeah. we can't that is a five yeah, times difference fair fair point fair point they can fund all this we can't okay uh, a little more about uh, uh, your stock picking process why why is devina having all the success she is having topping those numbers i get your sheet where you show the comparison of all the pmss what is it that you guys do that makes you top the pms charts time and again okay rahul before that let me tell you uh, the back story of our pms which is that okay. we had our pms license for the first time right after the sebi pms regulations came out which was i think year 2000 or 2001 but we did not launch a product for 20 years i mean it was internally a thing also that we have the brand name we have the approval why are we not launching a product and my reasoning was very simple that i don't want to take other people's money till i have something where i have some predictability some foreseeability some consistency so i you know your own money you can manage any which way but i did not want to manage uh, based on you know devina mera's picks you know that was not the intent so we waited till we had a system and this uh, so i mean for me i mean that's never a thing that everybody is doing it so let me do it so as i was saying in i said in one interview a couple of weeks back that i didn't mind being the very first not just indian but asian firm to go global in a sense i did not mind being kind of the last to launch a pms because my criteria always is that can i go, do a good job of this not what everybody else is saying or doing or whatever so now our basic engine is based on an artificial intelligence and machine learning system which i now notice people are just copying the name so for 3 years we have been saying human plus machine i now see new funds and schemes being launched with a man plus machine or man with machine <laughs> but i always say that people who can't think of a original three word name you think they are going to do the rigorous work of uh, nearly 2 million lines of code which is what we have and we, we we maintain rigor at every step of the way right from the quality of the data to you know how we pick the factors and so on i mean it's it, that's a whole different discussion so what the principle behind this if uh, those of you who read daniel kanaman thinking fast and slow and his noise i mean he basically says that any proper system will outperform a human being because it eliminates bias and it eliminates noise so biases i have written about extensively right from you know fund managers uh, tendency to storyify that i bought this company because of this this, this grand story that great brand this uh, Uh, uh amazing management etc which all which in the market doesn't care about your story so the whole point is that there are biases and also noise you know you can have uh, let's say 15 analysts all with 20 years of experience give them exactly the same data the same company and they will all have different opinions that is noise your own you know one day you come into office having had a fight with your spouse or in the traffic you will look at things differently that's also noise so what a system does is that you codify all your expertise and then it applies it on a bias free noise free basis on the entire universe of stocks we have other systems also but i'm just talking one system which is the bottom up system where you know in india for example we don't buy micro caps so we only look at stocks above a 1000 crore market cap and certain liquidity criteria so roughly about 750 companies so this system will rank everything from 1 to 750 after that we apply the human filter that you know the channel checks the where where does this company export to and so on so what might happen is that out of the top 75 companies we might pick pick 55 but we will not go to rank number 250 or 300 unless one of our other systems recommends it on some other basis let us say you no know, commodity cycle turn and so on and so forth so i mean yes since we started our returns are way above everyone else's 
but more importantly are risk adjusted returns whether you adjust for volatility or drawdown are way 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 above everyone else and that comes out of the system because the system also ensures first of all that risk is managed and and real life stress tests we've seen it so last year the day russia ukraine war broke out uh, the nifty and nse 500 were down 5% we were down 1.6% so that's where risk management kicks in you no know, we have a, a structured product in the uh, globally which uh, comparable products last year were i mean basically wiped out 50 to 90% down we were in the plus minus 2% range so you know every step of the way we build in risk management again you know diversification we've been talking about and i see enough people <laughs> picking up the world because i you know there's a family office i went to and they said you know devina ji wo pms wale pehle aate the kehte the concentrated portfolio mein hi return banta hai uh, only 15 20 stocks now the same guys come back and tell me ki 40 50 stocks ka portfolio hona chahiye to what has changed in the last two years As I said, sir, one thing has changed because we are performing, and people again do not go into the first principles. Diversification will not get you anywhere. What diversification does is it ensures that your returns are commensurate with your skill level. You know, the luck portion comes down and the skill portion comes up. So, I mean, it will work only if you have the skill. I mean, long and short of it is that because. i mean in mathematical or statistical terms it is ensuring that your real result is close to the expected value so if you can pick if you think you can pick the right stock 65% of the time it will ensure that the real result shows that rather than when you pick only 15 stocks you might be right in in a chance thing for a year a higher percentage but then that doesn't last so i mean we, we we believe in that that be consistent manage the risk tightly and always always think from first principles what you are doing why you are doing it rather well, than just copy from somewhere well you know it said about by everyone you ask anyone about a buy few say it's not buy straight <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we all get some bucks of the other so you have to do that so i order it oops uh your voice was cracking rahul now you are sounding better if you can repeat what you just said it would be better i think oh sorry Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. They have just two devices. Okay, you know, they the really a lot of the success depends on trying to control all this. Uh, how do you do it? Well, see, every investor has got a different way in which he has come up in life, and he's got a different access to risk, and he's got a different access to knowledge and interpretation of knowledge. Uh, he's got a different temperament. He's got different cash flows, etc. So obviously, it's like you know, two, uh, two humans are not going to be alike, and that is why uh, we have not been, we have not really gone into human cloning. Otherwise, humans would have had, you would have had race right now, which would have cloned people. I mean, you could have had some common characteristics, but you'll obviously differ in some way or the other. Yeah. So the first thing is to sort of understand yourself better, because if you don't understand yourself, you have to. So you are playing a role both as a human being and as an investor, and the roles are very different. A human can have a very sentimental approach to life and can be very soft-hearted at times and can be very hard at times. But investing, you know, has to take the sentiment out, and that's not easy uh, to sort of create the dichotomy there in your way of approaching. so for example in my portfolio if you ask me which is my favorite stock my answer is none my favorite stock today and my favorite stock after a few months and my favorite stock after a few years will never be the same i do not carry any bias that i love one stock at the cost of another for me my favorite stock is the one where my thinking proves right 
and if my thinking proves right and it proves right over a longer period of time then it is even more favorite for the time being because then it is sort of giving me the ability to buy more and more as we move up many people do not average up they only average on declines which again doesn't make sense it's like saying guys coming first in class repeatedly and you say no i'm not going to uh, you know invest in him i'm going to invest in the 50th guy because now the first guy i don't like which doesn't really make sense the second thing is that you know i look at capital from a from a more from a economic theory perspective that it has a, a opportunity cost uh there are uh, at any on any single day when i wake up in the morning there are there are 8000 or more scripts before me and i have limited capital and my objective that time is to put that capital to the most optimal use that i can find now if that optimal use is in a large cap mid cap small cap buying an existing stock buying a new stock i have zero uh, sort of reluctance to do what i think that new track of money can do for me then the question is does it make a difference to the portfolio and i hear so many people and i've read so many sort of comments from people saying no you cannot make returns if you have a diversified portfolio blah 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 but the point is if in my own case it has worked and there is i if i have if i for example believe that i can do you know as good as a fund or better than a fund and if it has worked for me then so it has worked now the question is which which stock in my portfolio ends up being a bigger weightage vis-a-vis something else this is also decided by the performance of that company market temperament you could have a situation where all of a sudden there's a market panic like you know that 5% example that devina was giving and something that you think is worthy cracks that day because there's liquidity problem or there's some you know some problem with somebody's margins or something of that sort and you have many opportunities in that journey Uh, similarly one of the advantages of being diversified is that if i get an idea this morning i don't have a problem in finding out what i have to sell in my portfolio because in a diversified portfolio to pick a you know one sort of uh, egg that's not hatched completely is far easier than in a concentrated portfolio where you build up so many stories in your mind convincing yourself that these are the best scripts that you will never be able to exit and therefore the opportunity cost of the money becomes way more complex it also completely stresses your mind in terms of you know arriving at a decision because you're leaving no margin of error then in your mind and that's not really good for a investor you need to be in a free flow state so so i follow those uh, those tracks and of course that's one of the reasons why as i just as an example and i don't mean it as an investment advice i had no reluctance to buy psu banks and shun the top private sector banks if i had to if i felt that the the trade was good for me and it was a good investment for me so be it and if i was wrong i would have carried the lessons of it so so if the moment you create preset biases in your mind your investment process is an extremely difficult one in fact i do not like people who post too many too many theoretical messages too many of quotes from books and this and that blah 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 it just doesn't work you're just putting these quotes without a reference to examples you cannot take even a buffet or a charlie munger and say that this is what they said i mean the behavior itself is so different over different periods of time they have done everything uh, you know to the contrary to what is said so so be an open minded person and if you are doing if you are able to apply certain rules that work for you and sort of give you the ability to mitigate risk because you know everybody has seen downfalls in the market now we have been like bruised by those downfalls many times so the only thing i can do is to go back and see that whenever these downfalls happen what went wrong and to whatever extent i can mitigate that risk so be it like for example keep some separate money with you to meet your livelihood and other requirements and i won't even call it livelihood i will say i to even meet some of your luxuries and if that is not going to be a obstacle in your mind then the market falls will not trouble you to the extent that they will trouble you if that money is required for a marriage or a home or a buying a inevitable asset that you cannot defer very interesting very thought provoking and it's very actionable it's tough to action it but uh, it can be done and uh, it sounds so logical uh, uh, devina uh, small caps what uh, can you talk specifics of what's starting to bother you uh, and whether you think that we are closer to the end than to the beginning when it comes to small caps i'm not even saying that that is necessarily the case rahul it is just that you know there's been too much euphoria and too much money pouring in and a lot of people 
who do not have uh, either the, who have not lived through obviously a whole lot of people have not lived through the previous crashes but who do not even have a sense of history as to what can happen so mm -hmm. that part is the worrisome part and also you know even if the index itself doesn't crash if the index goes down 5 7% individual stocks often in that area can go down 15 20% and there's like a lot of froth as safir also mentioned that lot of people talking about lot of lot of stocks which are fairly new so that is the part i mean uh, I, actually i remembered later that one of the uh, quest your sub questions in the last uh, question was the sector <laughs> <and> stuff <laughs> because you had everything from economy to the sectors in that question so in terms of sectors uh, just again this space was downloaded via spacesdown.com visit to download your spaces today you know our num i mean obviously we we are just coming to the quarter end so um, you know what our systems show this quarter i still have a couple of days to go before i get those results uh, but uh, as uh, things stand uh, the sector we have been most overweight on for quite a long time now in fact almost exactly 2 years we started in october 21 was capital goods and is capital goods and industrial machinery so that's a sector that we've been most overweight on i mean it's it's not that the peak weight that we went to we booked some profits we've changed some stocks because stocks there went up two times four times so people have started talking of industrials only in the last uh, few months whereas uh, we have liked it a long time and in fact the question i ask every quarter is that is the run over but till now our systems have not shown that the run is over and also also there is a background to that that the sector was an absolute underperformer absolute dog sector for long time so from 2009 to 2021 so good 12 years it was a absolute dog sector that gave a, you know a 2% compounding <laughs> over that period so and so the companies also the shake out there were companies that were left became lean and mean with the minimal cost so when the turn around in demand came they were all set to take advantage so that sector still remains number one for us in terms of overweight can we are very always very diversified sectorally so you know we we will never have like 40% in a sector or something like that this calendar year where we have added has been auto auto components pharma couple of construction companies um it especially mid cap it is also beginning to look uh, better we have been not heavily overweight but we would be slightly overweight there where we have started to cut has been banks i mean okay. somebody on twitter told me ki ye to aapka takia kalam hai ki i'm a nervous investor in banks but i am so i am so like <laughs> so you know i am as a i am a very investor in all lenders because uh, you know lending is a risky business it's a highly leveraged business it's a business where as an outsider you don't know where the skeletons are hiding where the negative surprises will come from and uh, so that uh, that's that said i mean we were never uh, we never had significant exposure to nbfcs banks we have cut back and as safir was mentioning ours also has been skewing more towards the psu banks uh, so that uh, that's where the some of that money for other overweight bets has come from and uh, i think that in, in sectorally that would be broadly uh, what we have liked of late i did i meant ph pharmaceuticals so pharmaceuticals is another yeah. one where we have added so that's that would that's be quite about a broad Yeah, that's quite a broad. Yeah, uh, always, I mean, we we always have fifty, sixty stocks in our portfolio, and many times they're not sector bets even. You know, and I was looking at our top performers each year; they have varied, and many of those stocks we don't hold anymore. You know, Deepak Nitrite might have been high up in one year, or Tata Alexi, but we may not be holding them now. So, and also like last year, our, among our top bets were. i mean top performers were itc and raymonds which were not sector bets so again as safir was saying that don't have preconceived notions and that is what the system also forces you to do 
like in 2020 when fmcg was the flavor of the season i had done a whole half an hour program on cnbc saying that there's nothing like a, a stock or a sector that always gives you returns even if they are in a stable business doesn't mean that the stock will give you return but at that time you know when everybody was rara on fmcg nobody was even talking of itc as an fmcg stock because it was not performing at that point but for our systems uh, in the next year it was the first fmcg stocks that our systems liked and we bought it and it was a grand performer for us so that's what the system forces you to do to at least get out of your biases and if, if the system likes it then you have to have a good reason why you are saying no to it wow. you know there is in, in systems they in systems they say you know it's it's a broken leg analogy that they say that you know let's say you want to uh, uh, estimate that will such a such a person come for this concert and you have whatever uh, x number of variables so that will do better than a person estimating it only exception is when that person knows for sure that that you know the, the that uh, this person has a broken leg and hence can't go for the concert so mm-hmm. unless, unless so like uh, for example last year you know one of the chemical companies our system like but then when we went into the fundamentals we said you know they, they have too large of an export book to europe so maybe you know next quarter numbers won't be that good so we did not buy and that turned out to be correct but then you you know it, it you can't just generally say no for no reason so uh, so like i said you know a, a broad array of sectors uh, as the result you know of of a process where you invested uh, safir uh, i know divina i don't think will talk stock safir but what about you uh, could you share uh, as you stand today uh, how is your portfolio leaning in terms of sectors and stocks if you are comfortable see uh, as as my portfolio stands today may be very different from where my portfolio stands after a month and if many of the people on this call are not uh, you know literally aware of what changes will come then they could be misled so that much of a sort of a, a caveat they have to carry because if somebody gets listens to something yes. you know it's very different when you have a secular idea and you say you're buying a company and uh, Uh, you, uh, you know, we've been fortunate that some of the companies that I, uh, you know, have spoken about or have expressed my my liking for have done exceptionally well in this market. But then, to if you ask me that did they expect those stocks to go up five times in one year and four times in one year, and will they go up four times more or will they even double from year? I'll say I don't know because that will depend upon the results that they show. I mean, just to give an example of the level of uncertainty. Uh, so many funds in india own navin sorokem and today the resignation of a key person brought down the stock by some 16 17% close to 52 week low so the entire gains of navin sorokem for the entire year or maybe two years or three years came to zero uh, or maybe not three years exactly but two years came to zero because of an unexpected development that happened in that company so there will always be these unexpected developments that will surprise spring a surprise now i have a, for example a overweight on banking for the last few years and if there is uh, you know something that is going wrong in terms of say a, one of the psus comes up and says that you know again we have to do an npa recognition which is very high because some account has gone bad it will obviously have a trickle effect on other things and then will i have the capability to distinguish between you know a good bank and a bad bank no i will not because i will not know next quarter who is going to spring a surprise but right now i'm more you know um, encouraged by some of the statements that seem to be coming from rbi some of the statements that are coming in from nclt some of the recoveries that are happening in res- in respect of asset reconstruction companies and other thing to believe that yes they are coming back from a very bad past and to that extent so far it appears that you know the the the, the thing is good for them um, so that's just one example uh, as far as sectors concerned like i told you i don't wake up every morning to a liking of a sector i wake up to uh, and i don't mean literally every morning but i wake up to the opportunity before me if i read in the newspaper or some article or some you know international magazine that opened, i've just come back from a foreign trip now i'll give you a, a very interesting example um, many people you know uh, take it, are looking at the market and for example may believe that the market is sort of 
ओवरडन बिकॉज यू नो यू विल से टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी फोर अर्निंग एंड टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी फाइव अर्निंग्स आर बिंग डिस्काउंटेड बैक्स टाइम डिपेंडिंग ऑब्वियसली ऑन विच कंपनी और सेक्टर यू टॉकिंग अबाउट and then people will say but you know you have a pli and that also to some extent may be discounted and you may have other incentives now when i was in europe the european companies were actually taking a different stand their stand was that we will invest in india once we find recovery in europe because one of the reason of investing in india is to make for the rest of the world also like we will not just come and invest to make in india as uh, many companies when they look at china plus one china was a base for them to export to the rest of the world now if the rest of the world stays in recession many parts of the world are in recession and uncertainty then they don't have the reason to invest today and if they don't invest today then the ancillary effect of that on many companies that are you know sort of going to team up with these companies provide parts etc becomes uh, impacted on the other hand if they find that there's a resolution because certain parts of the world uh, you know recover vis-a-vis something else Uh, then th- that level of investment is a long term money coming in the short term i mean somebody will set up a plant in india for the next 10 years but that money will come in very fast and that very fast money will have, will benefit a lot of companies that you know it's like the axe and the shovel example so they will benefit a lot of other companies so therefore investing is a journey and you, there is no favorite except uh to keep investing and to remain diversified and where you find your bets to sort of keep increasing and where you find doubts you know that's the other thing when i have a doubt on the company i don't like the doubt to linger on i wait for a day two days three days in my intuitive feeling is three days also i'm worrying about it and i feel 8000 companies mein ek chali jayegi to kya ho gaya i mean what's a big deal as long as your portfolio does well so keep an open mind and keep uh, looking for opportunities there are going to be a lot of opportunities but there'll also be a lot of setbacks Yeah, yeah, that's valid point. Uh, okay, so we will take some questions, but a house rules: please keep the questions very, very brief. Yeah, just a few seconds, please, so we can take as many questions as possible. Uh, Prince, you're going to help me with this. Uh, I am not sure how we're going to do this. Prince, you there? Hey, how? Uh, hi, Rahul. So, Rahul, uh, I'm as a speaker, uh, not able to uh, add anyone, but uh, I can help with the questions in the comments. Meanwhile, I have a small question to Devina, ma'am, and Safir, sir. So, basically, these days, like uh, there is, uh, I mean, uh, more focus of people, uh, especially the retail on that order book investing. So, any any thoughts around that? Superb question. <laughs> Superb. so this means what that you are investing based on the order book of the company is or right. does it mean something else in the morning they'll be breaking news some company has got a 100 crore rupee order to build some railway track right and the next thing you'll have is the stock will rally like crazy for the next few days and it's been happening across sectors i think prince that's what you're referring to right okay we buyer beware is what i would say so <laughs> <laughs> there are you know and many and safir will and safir will say true to form cabby debtor since he is a lawyer <laughs> no i will say as a lawyer other things being equal <laughs> <laughs> so i mean yeah. you should look at the news but you know don't get swayed by just one piece of news and also in many of these uh, uh, you don't even know how that will actually pan out whether that project actually goes through what happens like i mean just to give you an example the uh, the sea link in bombay i mean that became a millstone around the neck of the company which had got it because there was there were overruns which were not uh, then getting passed so i mean that actually became the reason for a spiral down for the company so i mean the, just getting an order is not the be all and end all and definitely not the sort of thing where you should be putting any big bets so as i always as i again repeat investing is a losers game so be sure that you are not uh, taking a risk where there is a risk of a, a big uh, drawdown and as safir said there are plenty of fish in the pond so you don't have to do anything and 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 also think about this that you know you are an outsider by the time the news is coming to you obviously there are a whole lot of people who already knew about it and so therefore i mean be careful about this whole thing 
and large orders from a single entity are uh, carry their own risks is it is not the same thing as a revenue which comes from a diversified consumer base you know i just oh. wanted to add one point to this uh, and in just as you're talking in the context of order books you know it is very sad and it will have a very bad ending for sure uh because people are not investing in ipos by reading what the companies are doing or what their projections are they are investing in ipos based upon gray market premiums i mean i've never in my life for the last so many years seen so much of activity around this gmp or whatever it is called every day now even prominent newspapers when they cover an ipo they will say that this is an offer for so and so share and these are anchor investors and promoter holding will be so and so they don't talk much about the business you will not if you can google at least about 10 of the ipo that were listed hardly anybody talking about the business the next column will say great market premium is at 30% 20% so and so and so and people are looking at that number and over subscribing now i'll give an example i was tracking just for academic interest i don't have a uh, investment in it an ipo that came recently it was oversubscribed 100 times and the gray market premium was supposed to be some 40% uh, eventually when the company was listed i mean listed as of today's price the price, the premium is only about 6% now to the offer price now are you telling me that everybody in the world was making a run just to get that 6 rupees or pi which effectively has sort of fizzled out completely it just shows uh, if you look at so many of our, the ipos the fro- while you know somebody will look at the offer price and say they are up but somebody will look at the high price and say but they are down so much and re- literally nobody is understanding this in fact some of the ipos are now below our offer price so so th- this is a clear frenzy which is m- making absolutely no sense at all i don't even see these companies uh, talk being spoken about uh, you know beyond a week of their listing in fact in some cases i was observing the commentary of one of the companies that came for ipo the promoter is saying because you guys oversubscribe so much in the next 3 years we will reward you and not reward the promoters now what kind of a statement is that you will reward them for subscription including of non allotees it's so silly <laughs> Well, since I'm, uh, yeah, so I mean, just to add, since you were talking about IPOs, the only part I disagree with is that this has not happened before. You know, the grey market <laughs> premium may not have been there in the pink papers, but uh, I mean, the IPO frenzies come with unfailing regularity and with again, as uh, Charles can, uh, uh, John no, can. No, I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about that. What I'm saying is, I remember the times when IPO forms were also sold at a premium. I'm not on that. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I, I, I get you. All, all I'm saying is that this happens with unfailing regularity. People forget Reliance Power or to throw them in DLF when it listed. I mean, it was again a hyped IPO. It even. i think doubled on listing and then never saw that price again for decades so i mean people just forget i mean i was looking at something in 1881 in uh, in on the paris boards ipo frenzy so that you know the equivalent of their samosa and batata vada walas were handing out uh, short prospectuses so <laughs> and i was looking at my video of two year ago two years ago in november 2021 when all this you know this phase of new age tech companies came in and exactly the point that i had pointed out then that if you prove a business model more uh, people will come in and so on i mean that, that's what you are seeing playing out in in that la- lot of stocks you know the nikas of the world so <laughs> but i mean at some point uh, uh, people just start to think that this is a lottery game that you That's that right. you are just playing a process rather than buying a company that you will just flip out and you will yeah. find some gre- greater fool till that bubble bursts i mean that is the mm-hmm. uh, that i mean i would recommend to all of you to read this book called a short history of financial euphoria it's a very short book you can read it in a single sitting but what a book and it lays out how bubbles form and why it's a characteristic of you of uh, financial markets to forget history and therefore bubbles form again and again see and it, then the bus back to what you're saying any person who would have read generally some basic books also would know that in order to succeed in a wager or a bet 
the chances of success for you will become much more difficult when if you do too frequent bets now what is happening is that if you are basically betting only on grey market premium and the speculation and options and all this even the exchanges are now feeling the need to increase the spread for you in fact i find this uh, this move to increase to allow trading at 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock and options and all without increasing the depth of the derivative market completely meaningless so what's basically happening is you keep increasing ipos you keep increasing uh, the hours of trading now more and more people keep betting and eventually you know it's the the bet size keep going up and then they get hit so which is why the statistics is suggesting that 90% odd plus of people who are doing this sort of speculative trading do not end up making money but they are getting more and more lured because you are just showing them carrots and carrots and carrots and carrots in fact the interesting thing is not only that 90% of them don't make money but even the 10% that make money make an average of something like 5000 rupees a month So, so there is, you know, even for that ten percent, there is no great, uh, you know, pot of gold. But like, uh, I mean, this, people like hate to said, look at statistics. Like someone said on X, right? That the uh, that the regulator and the exchanges are not happy that ninety percent, only ninety percent people are losing money. They're going to increase the trading hours to take it up all the way to hundred. <laughs> But anyways, okay, let's let's take some questions. uh cyrus you go first into hands up please keep it very very brief okay yeah this cyrus, one is for okay. devina uh you know i am a very avid investor in small caps and my question to you is assuming you have done all your homework due diligence everything and you zero in on a small cap and suddenly after a few quarters you see revenue and profits falling so when after how many quarters of falling revenues and profits makes you feel that this is not a temporary phenomenon and now is the time to get out while you can okay great question cyrus over so to the there is, so there is no formula to this which is why i say diversify because even if you're doing it yourself uh, don't have i mean like a small case usually has between 25 and 30 stocks which is i think the bare minimum you need to diversify because out of that now you know one of the biggest mental flips you can do is that when you make an investment tell yourself that i may be making a mistake up front because it is a given that a certain number of your investment decisions are going to go wrong and this is one of the things which human beings go wrong with because they hate to admit mistake they hate to take losses there is a loss aversion bias that is built into us through evolution so that's why biases are so hard to get rid of because they are they they serve an evolutionary purpose so coming back to your question i mean there is no formula to it maybe you should you know get out at the first instance no oh, who knows i mean depends on why that revenue has fallen and what industry it is in and so on and and always as you know be uh, quick to take a loss and get out holding on in hope is not a good thing so i mean like for example if we say for our pms or small case that uh, the on the buy side it is a human plus machine model on the uh, risk management side it is a machine only model so if for example a stop loss is hit you get out You, we don't allow human beings to override because human beings will override they will say this stock is different this time it is different i am convinced it will come back so and in a small cap you have to be uh, even more risk averse because you know often as i said there are no exits in the first place so uh, and in small case your hit rate small uh, caps your hit rate is going to be lower there will be more place more number of times you will go wrong Okay, let's move to the next question, uh, Ravi. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Rahul, and fantastic space, uh, Divena and uh, Safir. You know, I work in the space of green growth, so my question really is from a future perspective, which is really looking at investments in the green growth space. And you know, what are your predictions and maybe calculations when it really comes to the Indian market really standing on to issues of like uh, green energy, uh, EV, uh, solar? biofuel and i know that 
maybe it's too early on, but I think it's great to come in early on in terms of investments. Uh, you know, just to uh, uh, add to that, you know, we're organizing a Green Growth India Investment Summit in New York in uh, November. So really, it's ready to look at from the future green market, you know, so going into that space. Mm-hmm. Uh, first, Devina, and then maybe Safir. Okay. So you may not like my answer, <laughs> Ravi. <laughs> now, I mean, this is, this is uh, 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 my framework. And I tweeted this also a few days ago, that just because a new uh, business or a new technology is going to make a lot of changes in the world, it's going to revolutionize the world in, in a in a sense, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be a great investment. So there are, say, first of all, there are many, many times that technologies show promise uh, and uh, they're talked about hyped and you go back over the years, you'll find many of those and they may not even live up to their promise. But I'm saying even the technologies that live up to their promise and two big examples in the last century, automobiles and air travel fundamentally changed the world, fundamentally changed how humans live. But both of them have been a graveyard of uh, companies. If you go back over the history of airlines, if you go back over the history of automakers, it's been a graveyard. And even the so-called uh, companies that made it, you know, the, the what were the big three in automakers in in the U.S., General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. Even then, that they also went through crisis. So, you know, especially at the beginning, you don't know who's going to be the winner. And often it is not the first guy who not just makes it, but even makes it big. I mean, uh, before F- Facebook, Orkut was the uh, in uh, this thing. And now the, the whole cycle of companies is getting shorter. At one point, Nokia and BlackBerry were the thing in uh, mobiles. Now it is something else. So, as I said, just because it Technology genuinely changes the world doesn't necessarily even mean that you will find the right investment in that. You don't know who the winners will be. Safir, anything you'd like to add? No, uh, you know, there's a completely different uh, approach when you look at a sector per se, which is, for example, you say green energy and I'll say, yes, green energy will will do well. Now you you... Uh, basically say that which part of green energy will do well amongst the listed spheres, then my question will be, how do you assess that the unlisted sphere will not do well? How do you assess that new technologies will not come, which will disrupt? I mean, I, I'll give an, a case study. Look what happened to Mozabe when it got into photovoltaic cells. The entire company came crumbling down because the technology failed and same thing had happened with CD technology and the cost and so many examples. Some of them Devina has just shared. So the difficulty is that you cannot access and then our market gets euphoric. Like, for example, even if you find that there are good companies, they may be good. And maybe, Ravi, you've got better insights because you handle this. The question is still going to be that the market has not left any valuation comfort because everything is, you know, if just because it's a new sector, it is valued at 50 times, 60 times, 70 times. And then you look at the stock behavior, it is if most of the moves would have come in the last three months because of more of social media impact. Somebody just coming and spinning a complex model around the company saying that this is now into XYZ field and look at the potential that it will have. Now reverse it, you will find that the chairperson of Maruti is not very sure about, uh, you know, when it comes to e-vehicles. He's saying that I'm going to experiment more with gas vehicles and, uh, uh, you know, they're working on that line. Toyota is not making forward statements in respect of what they're doing. I was in Germany and I met almost the all top uh, automobile companies. They're saying we don't know what is happening with lithium or hydrogen or something. We are experimenting to see their primary objective is not just the green technology is also to make cars lighter, uh, which therefore is going to have another trade off. How do you make the cars lighter because of the battery, lithium batteries and all make it you know more heavy? Um, uh, Mercedes new uh, you know e-vehicle has a problem that the battery is at the, right at the base of the car and in India the speed breakers and the road bumps end up being way higher than in other countries so they don't know what impacts it will have so the question is very difficult to decide and you know the even company like Hindustan Petroleum, Bharat Petroleum, Indian Oil all these companies are not coming out with documented policies 
that really say even the government is experimenting like for example we are doing a lot on the uh, on the ethanol front but the rest of the world doesn't do, uh, follow ethanol now whether it it is good for india because from an import perspective it does well but is it good for the environment well you know it's not something that is that is very uh, clear in terms of that so will it lend up end up in continuity in perpetuity no but in the short run of course it is giving a lot of boost and i am also a beneficiary because i own some of the sugar companies do you think i can own the sugar companies for the next 10 years uh, i don't i don't think so personally so so it's like you you can take a bet on a sector but it's very difficult to take a bet now if you are very lucky to get get in very early uh, and you have the ability to understand the sector then of course you may strike uh, a better return but it is not going to be easy for most people uh, to sort of decipher this okay great uh, prince you have a question so devina ma'am and safir sir uh, so we uh, have a election year ahead so any any correlation uh, i mean uh, from your past experience uh, between the markets and election year and especially in lines with the infrastructure sector hard to say friends i mean hard to say i mean i mean obviously generally the government tends to spend a little more you know when the elections are coming up and even for that matter the market reaction to elections you don't know because i was uh, just thinking about 2004 elections and i mean makes you feel old that it was 20 years but on the day of the election uh, when a very unexpectedly nda did not win and the congress led upa came the market fell 11% and i think it was 15% intraday and 11% end of the day but then in a few days time it it made it all up and i think for that year it was up 23 24% so those kind of things are very hard to say and i don't think you know we you can really invest based on that that would be my thinking and i think that there to a large extent the engine of the economy anyway goes on uh, regardless of what's happening on the political front safir Sir, you want to add anything on that? No, I I agree this. In fact, you know, typically, the uh, if I look at from the perspective of a new government coming in or new government, me means including the continuity of the existing government. First point is that what is so radically different because they have anyways taken long term plans. Most of the focus of this government has been you know large ticket large ticket changes which have already been going. It is as much as the budget has become inconsequential. There was a time the budget had so much important, but every month on Man, there are, or you know, there's some announcement happen on road, on infrastructure, on policies, on trade bilaterals, etc. So it is not that the direction of that is going to substantially change. And I do not personally believe that uh, even other governments, even if uh, in some parts of India there are, for example, non-BJP related government, they are going to radically change their policy because some of them are now aligned to GST and other you know national policies and uh, FDI and. Uh, state related investments and G- you know so many other things so i don't think there's going to be a substantial change in uh, in uh, anything in fact i believe the fact that if a substantial part of the infrastructure uh, gets done and i mean basic infrastructure which means like roads and other things get settled then the government might be left uh, in a few years down the line maybe two or three years down the line with certain surpluses the way the tax collections are which may enable them to finally look at uh, cutting taxes particularly on the high tax uh, payers which which uh, is a sector which uh, which is a segment which according to me has been ignored for a lot of time you cannot uh, endlessly keep going and taxing the highest tax payer again and again and again and if that tax cut comes then they will have more incentive to invest and i don't mean stock market investment investment in capex and business expansion etc it's already happened for the corporates which is very favorable but i do believe that uh, you know at some point of time there will be incentives for the highest end of tax payers as well okay wonderful last question babulal you may unmute yourself good evening to all i am devina ma'am so my question is about the turn around stories uh for example tega took over there forward manufacturing by macnil siraji or or that matter so long deciding to get out of the date such turnaround stories or entering in the beginning like 
Trans India Limited, where the company was just unknown to anybody, and those who entered it, right, including me. So, what? How do you take these turnaround stories? Very cautiously and very carefully. Okay. So only if you know for sure that something is happening. I mean, it is. It's right that even if you look at a cyclical industry, let's say a cement or a steel, when an upturn comes, often the worst company in the industry gets the biggest boost because it's the biggest benefit. It's the biggest beneficiary because, it, you know, if, if let us say there are two companies and you no know, one has a margin of ten uh, percent and one has a margin of five percent and hardly any net margin if 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 the margins go up to three percent point that you know the the worst company's uh, net margin goes up the most they can repay the debt and you know if the price goes up maybe they can raise some equity money so generally that is the that's the good outcome but you know many times these stories are floated and you you need you may not know whether that's that is the whole truth so only if you can verify the details and it, you do the numbers always do the number that how much of an impact will this thing have if they repay the debt or if this happens or you know they have some um, some uh, thing with the uh, something changes either in the business or in their financial structure uh, but whatever you do you should not take outside bets on things like this no, no certainly not because this is the sort of this is the sort of thing where you might have a multi bagger you might have something going to zero also yes. so and especially as an outsider as a lay investor you know do your homework carefully and even then don't take a very large bet yeah i fully agree with you uh, first of all i never invest in the cyclicals i am from manufacturing field so i study company well you only if i like their manufacturing model then only i invest i do not invest in every turn around story and not certainly okay. here say turn around story only whatever okay. is seen in track okay great yeah great. thank you thank you bab thank you okay i think we need to close this we already over time a little uh, devina uh, any final comments for our attendees and then uh, safir you can follow up after that please yeah so as once again thank you all for being there and uh, i would say that uh, respect your money so you know this is hard earned money that you are putting in the markets so don't do things arbitrarily don't do things based on what some telegram group is telling you or what some you know or even what somebody on tv is telling you so have a systematic process even if it is a simple process so even if you let's say you say that i want to buy companies with this kind of growth this kind of return on equity this kind of pe whatever your five criteria are then you filter companies according to that and buy that because what i find is that you might say all these things but when you actually look at the portfolio you have bought some stuff which which your the last party somebody recommended and so on and and also i mean the most critical part which we didn't get a chance to talk about this time is that look at your asset allocation so always i mean where you want to be in your asset allocation is the second step but as i say in google maps you first have to put your current location or where you want to start from so look at your current allocation of how much is in fixed income how much is in equity how much is in real estate how much is in gold and so on how much is outside india again one thing which we didn't talk about that you must have globally diversified portfolio only if you know the starting point then you can go to where you want to be and how you get there because most of your return is determined by that within equities in india a lot of your returns will be uh, determined by the sector you are in so always be cognizant where you are in, on all these dimensions rather than arbitrarily just adding stocks from here and there so respect your hard earned money and manage it systematically properly not arbitrarily yes safir i think i will uh, agree with that and that is a you know their words of wisdom my my essential point for you for anybody would be that when you come to the market to buy a particular script you must ask yourself that why are you buying the script in the first place because if you are buying the script just because and and i'm talking from personal experience i mean there are people who come to me they they have so much of a feeling of being left out with the small caps and mid caps 
that now they want to just buy whatever they can lay their hands on and some of them get so desperate in that uh, you know that uh, joining the race halfway through the racing track that they believe that by buying more quantities they would be able to sort of compensate for their their inability to do a process that is a, like an sip or a you know over a large number of years and i find it very very weird that in in the investment world the more uh, uh, exotic you make a product the more complex you make a company the more subsidiary that it has the more related party transactions the more block deals people like it even more uh, i also don't understand uh, this notion that why you have to buy companies only when they break dmas and go into highs and other things when you know over a period of time the law of the land is that there is there's averages and you know under penetrated sectors catch up and uh, you know over over hype sectors fall but everybody wants to get up uh, in the over hype sector as if it's not going to end and it will cross the skies also so you have to be uh, diversified to that extent because it is very difficult in the market to know uh, you know how long the euphoria will lie and most importantly when the market corrects why do people get into this massive mode of uh, you know uh, literally like panic like if in the last few days if the market corrected 4 or 5% i've even seen tv channels saying the market is crashing now now nobody has interest etc cetera, etc cetera. what is this crash that we are talking about because market is defined as an opportunity whether that opportunity is in a large cap small cap mid cap something that has gone up 10% 20 30 is a completely different thing it is not as if everything is going to fall in every or i mean things can fall but not everything is going to fall at the same level or rise at the same level and even if you buy something that falls as long as you have a focus on what it is doing and you have the ability to keep sort of lingering on and adding to it or being patient and sometimes doing nothing i mean you can be sitting in the market and doing nothing and being adequately rewarded but that uh, you know that feeling within that i have to be super active and i have to be the superman of the market is going to be quite destructive because it will just drive your cra- your thinking crazy uh, and i also don't understand this why people you know try to emulate other investors they may have better skills you may have better skills you may come out with better choices if you go through a process of learning if i was to for example call all my friends who are in the investment and ask them what they are buying i would be the most confused person because i'll be in a complete tug of war in different directions uh, and then it it becomes very difficult to invest and you know coat tailing doesn't succeed typically i mean you can see even from the examples of late mr junjunwala he made a lot of money on some stocks maybe 5 6 7 8 companies but he lost a lot of money on 60 70 80 other companies you could have been in the 60 70 80 other companies pool so don't believe that you know anything and some of the highest and you know i also don't understand this notion that quality is not a function of in the stock market quality is not a function of the quality of a company quality is a function of the quality of returns they are completely unrelated you could buy a company that is not the highest uh, uh, you know level company the market leader and you could have substantial returns and you could buy the leader and be sit and sit with no returns and then you will keep giving lectures to the others saying but these are high quality companies are but your money is not growing even inflation is killing it so have that sort of mindset to be uh, to be you know uh, to sort of absorb that and to adapt to that you have to adapt to the market wonderful uh, thank you very okay, much just just that. just, just yeah. one thing I want to add yeah. which is really taking off from what sir you said which is that you know the worst mistakes you will make are because of fomo this fear of missing out so i mean i see which is exactly what safir also spoke about that you know don't try to jump onto a bus you think yeah. has already left i mean one of my favorite quotes is uh, it was in richard branson's book i don't know whether it's his original or not the opportunities are like buses there's always another one coming along so you should get the next bus don't try to jump onto something which has left the station great thank you everyone for attending thank you divina thank you safir i know i think we should definitely do another spaces where the key focus areas include asset allocation and international investing the ones that we missed today because we ran out of time is been wonderful my my parting message to all the attendees please your money your responsibility uh think hard take care of your biases and please if you're following influencers who have no track record please rethink your strategy right your money your responsibility 
चलो विद दैट हैव अ सेफ सेफ यूर अहेड एंड यू नो हैप्पी इन्वेस्टिंग टू यू ऑल थैंक यू एवरी